Well, good evening to everybody here. I'm sure if you've been here for the last three nights, you're probably pretty tired, because I know I am. I'm exhausted. We've been doing a lot of work, been really good, a lot of fellowship, a lot of food. You know, those are the, almost the Baptist credos. Well, let me just kind of tell you real, real quick, just uh, first off, um, so last night we had 7,446 in the box, and uh, so we have grown by a lot of that. I'm see where my number is here. So today we did over over 5,000 for a total of 12,495 in the box. So yeah, so we're we're moving progress. Well, that's really good. So now there's a few boxes that are not actually up here yet. There's still a few that haven't been brought in that uh, that is included in that count. But I figure if it's in the box and the box is taped, we count it. Amen. That's right. And so, uh, so things are going well. Uh, we've been doing really, really, really well. Thing, we've had some hiccups, but that's okay. I'll talk more about those a little later. Uh, but I just wanted to give you that update. We still have work to do. I mean, I, as much as we want to be done on, on Wednesday night at 10 o'clock and call it, you know, go home, get a good night's rest, and know that these are done. We, we can tell you that there's still some work that need, needs to be done tonight, and uh, and probably tomorrow. I will. There is no probably about it. It is going to happen tomorrow. So if you can make it tomorrow in the morning, we're going to try to knock these out uh, and uh, finish up the project. I have no idea what that means, how long we need. But basically, we've got a bunch of Bibles that are New Testaments that need to be bound. And once, they, once they're bound, then we can cut them and box them. So, um, you know, that's basically where we're at. Everything on the E-Wing side of the building, everything in the, you probably notice that the Connections counter has moved back to its, reg its normal location. There's no Bibles, there's no New Testaments, no signatures in the lo in the lobby. The E wing, the classrooms in the E wing, have been put back together so that they're ready for Sunday, or I guess the next thing is Sunday. Um, and uh, and so all of that's been done. So everything is in the lobby. I'm sorry, in the library, uh, ready to go to the binder and from the binder out to the uh, to the armory to get cut. We had a great crew out there in the armory today. Uh, I don't know how many people there were out there, but we were moving some Bibles through that machine until the machine gave, a, gave it up. Could say something else. Had to be careful. Uh, but that's okay. The machine is back and running. Even though it, it gave us a fit the last hour, it is right now running. Just keep it in prayer, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get the job done. So thank you. Hello, Pastor Pirira from Malawi. Uh, we are very grateful for, uh, for the opportunity to share with you uh, the status update of the project we did together uh, to print the Bibles in our local language. We only had one version of the Bible, but now uh, with your help, we're able to print the New Testament from the received text. We are so grateful that 25,000 Bibles uh, in 2020 were printed uh, boxed and uh, sent to us from you, Heartland uh, Fellowship Baptist. We are so grateful for that. We have been able to distribute them to the pastors that are in the uh, Passion Center for Pastors Training, uh, which is a three-year program. We are able to uh, distribute about 1,300 pastors and their churches that are represented uh, in, the, in the training. And very recently, we've also been able to um, distribute to uh, people in the uh, southern region that were affected by the flood, uh, homes destroyed, and also their Bibles destroyed, so we're able to distribute uh, to those churches. We are very grateful for that. We are currently in a project uh, to, um, uh, to translate the Old Testament uh, and also reviewing it so that it can also be printed. And so please pray with us. Uh, that the process goes well and that we are, uh, we are able to uh, print the Old and the New Testament and make that Bible available to the people of Malawi. Very grateful for your support. God bless you.
Church, say Chichewa. Oh, that wasn't good. Say Chichewa. Now, isn't that just a fun word to say? I, I don't know about you, but I think it's a fun word to say. Um, Chichewa, yeah. Um, so, Annabeth and I had the privilege of hosting the Jalowicks um, last year. I think it was last year. Was it last year, Annabeth? Okay, last year. And um, now what's interesting is Chichewa is a language uh, that's spoken in Malawi, but the people group actually bleeds into Zambia as well. And so there's a portion of, of people who speak Chichewa that um, the Jalowicks minister to as well. And so we had the benefit of talking with the Jalowicks about um, the blessing that they had with giving Bibles out in that language as well. And it was just a huge blessing that we take it for granted that we have the full counsel of the Word of God. We, we take it so for granted that we have the Bible in our heart language. And um, the stories that the Jalowicks told about uh, people who just would, would take the Bible and, and they, would, they would kiss it because they, they so long to hear or to have the Bible in their own language. And so not only uh, the impact on the eastern part of Zambia, but also the impact on Malawi, which is one of the poorest countries in the entire world, um, in, in Malawi. Um, and for us to touch a people that we know, if you, if you uh, read Scripture and see what the Lord says about poor and about those who are destitute, the Lord loves them. And this is a chance for the Lord to reach out and to touch them with his word. In, in Mark chapter 9, verse 38, it says, oh, actually, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, Matthew, it's probably Matthew. <laughs> I went to the wrong book. Matthew uh, 9, 38, I think it is. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's a prayer that I pray when we're going out um, into um, neighborhoods and into places that, that God would send forth laborers um, as we go out with Igo. But the same is true in this case, is that right now they need laborers to participate in this, this translation opportunity. The, the Old and the New Testament. And we heard um, Pastor Chibwana talk about the fact that it impacts 1,300 pastors. Th this is a huge outreach that touches um, nearly an entire country, and we know it spills out into another country. And so as we pray in a few minutes, we need to pray that God would send forth more laborers um, into the harvest for this harvest in Malawi and also in Zambia. Uh, as well, um, another thing that I think is helpful to pray about is um, what are those translators looking for? What's the most precious knowledge that those translators need? They need scripture, but they need the words, right? Like we were singing about ancient words, right? And in Ephesians uh, 6, 18, uh, 6, 19, it says this. Paul is, is uh, praying um, that he would be used and praying for the saints. But in, in Ephesians 6, 19, he says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That word utterance actually means words. <laughs> Words, and that's what the translators need. What we need to be praying for the translators is that God would give them utterance, the words that they need for the translation to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, they're translating the Old Testament because they, they have the New Testament, but with the Old Testament, that makes known the mystery of the gospel in the full counsel of the Word of God. We take it so for granted, but we have in this book what God is doing with all of history. And those 
in this region, they only have part of the story. We need to pray that God would give them the full story so God could disciple them in a deeper way. So let's, let's take a couple minutes uh, to pray for this work. Pray that God would give utterance to those who translate it. Pray for labors and pray that God would make known the mystery of the gospel. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we praise you for the fact that you care for even the most destitute, the poorest in this world, Lord. We thank you that your, your heart is a heart of love beyond what we can comprehend. And Lord, you are reaching out with your word, your word of love, your word of truth, your, love, your word of grace, and we pray that you would send forth laborers into this work, that your name would be honored, that it would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, high and lifted up. Father, we pray that you would give utterance, that you would give the words that are needed for that translation process because you have specific words. Each and every word is important to you. You've made that clear in Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would give them uh, the words, that you would give them utterance. Lord, we pray for these 1,300 pastors, for these churches, Lord, that you would raise them up, raise up leadership and through discipleship, through the, the counsel of your word. We thank you for this work. We thank you that we are able to participate through prayer or whether through giving or through support and later with, with trips going over there and seeing what you are doing. Lord, it is amazing that we get to be a part of your kingdom and the kingdom that you are raising up and that we will see someday in Zion, Lord. And we will hear of all the work that's gone on, these Bibles that we've we put together this week and what's going on um, in Zambia and Malawi, that everyone would know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Playing tag team, up and down, up and down. Just wanted to take a, a moment and just remind you, we talked last night, I, I, I made a, a plea to everybody that was here, and you might not have been here last night, so this will be for you especially, but um, I made a comment just a little bit ago that our cutter, the trimmer, has been up and down and being finicky. Persnickety, I think, is a term. I don't know if that's a valid term for a machine, but it's irritating that it's always up and down, and sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Uh, it'll be five minutes or, or an hour and five minutes before we get it going again, and it's just constantly frustrating. Uh, when you have a project at this size, uh, to know that, it, uh, that the machine could stop and never restart, it's really uh, just, you know, I hold my breath every time it does I hear, I, I hear the machines running and it's, and it's going, and next thing I know, it's like I turn it because it stopped. I, you know, I just know that it stopped, so I can tell by the sound in the room. And sure enough, it has stopped. And I push a button, push a button, try to get it going again. Okay, it's running. Keep going. Fail again. Keep going. Fail again. So the only way we can deal with this, I mean, it's been a good cutter. I really even you know, had a. It has really blessed the ministry. We've cut some really pretty Bibles with that machine. And, uh, uh, but we need to buy a new one. And so I put a plea out last night to the church uh, to consider uh, covering some of the cost. I think I told you it was about a $58,000 machine. And so they're not cheap. This will be a brand new machine. It's not a used machine. I'm not buying like you buy. Everybody here probably has bought a used car. And you know what it's like to buy a used car. You buy a used car, next thing you know, you're replacing the transmission, then you have to put the brakes in, and, and then something happens at the front end, you got to put parts in, and you just get tired of that after a while, constantly breaking down, constantly repairing it, constantly putting money in it. 
Um, and so that's kind of what's happening with this machine, and so we didn't want to replace it. So I'm asking you to consider, we're going to take up an offering here shortly, uh, both for the machine, the ministry, and the conference. And uh, so um, if you have a, the, if you had a chance from last night to pray about it, I hope you did. And I hope God moved you to, to donate just a little bit. I even told you, you know, 1%, half a percent of the cost, you know, just something, anything, any dollar amount would be great. And so I'm just asking you for, to do that and help us co cover the cost of the conference and cover the cost of the ministry. The ministry has expenses. I shipped, I haven't told everybody this, but I shipped 300 Bibles to Zambia uh, last Saturday. And uh, that's about a $500, surprisingly, about a $500 cost. Like the ministry pays for that. The church doesn't pay for that. We raise money the best we can to try to pay for those things. Uh, so just want you to know that and uh, the shipping of these back to Milford uh, to bearing precious seed that's going to cost us a little bit of dollars um, and so you know we hit it's, a, it's an expensive ministry but it, the project the, the purpose is good and uh, and so we're going to take up an offering I'm going to ask Bob Hall to come up and pray over the offering and uh, when he does we'll have we'll have the plates uh, passed the, the ushers will take care of that and uh, if you, if you are not prepared to donate, but you feel like you want to donate, you can do that online, of course, easily. You can also donate next week on Sunday, or you can donate anytime you want. Uh, just contact uh, the office or do it online or um, on, uh, send it in mail, whatever you want to do. So, Bob, come on up and let's pray. We're playing tag team tonight, so uh, let's pray over the offering. Father in heaven, we, we come to you tonight, Lord, and we just want to give you honor and glory for who you are, Lord. Uh, just the fact that you are God, you are creator, there is no one but you, Lord. So we praise you for that. We also praise you for the love that you have for us. We praise you for uh, what you've given to us. You know, what you've given to us, we have our salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, you, you've, you haven't stopped there. You've given us a home in heaven. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You've given us eternal life. And honestly, you've given us everything, Lord. We, pray, we praise you for that. And I just I want to pray for this offering tonight, Lord, that we would give back a little to you, that we can use it to further your word around the world, that it would help buy the equipment that we need, the signatures that we need, the, the printing, and... All, all the details that, that do cost money, Lord. But I, I pray for this offering that it would meet our needs. I also pray that you would take it and use it more mightily than we could even imagine. Lord. Pray for that tonight. I, I uh, thank you for this week, and I pray that we have a great opportunity to get your word out, giving us open doors. pray that you use this offering again to continue that, get your word out to people that need it. So they can have a relationship. So in Christ's name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. As the offering uh, is uh, being taken up, I just want to uh, prepare us to uh, hear the word of God. And before I introduce our speaker tonight, uh, I just want to mention, uh, you know, tonight, well, we'll tell, kind of give it away a little bit. The, the topic tonight is our need to translate the word of God. And this week we've added a new wrinkle to the Bible conference because, you know, when you're publishing the Word of God, whether you're preaching it, proclaiming it, uh, you know, verbally, or we're, uh, we're in the process of teaching it, um, or we're, we're, we're actually publishing it in the, in the written form, uh, at the end of the day, that leads you to people groups because we're accomplishing the mission. Uh, we want to get to the people that need the Word of God. Uh, obviously, uh, we do a lot of English translations. We do a lot of Spanish translations, but we're also doing Ukrainian translations. So that means uh, I, we got to get the word in all these other languages. And we've talked about that this week. So we saw Justin Bedwell is praying about how he's going to tackle the Tonga project in Africa. Uh, we've looked at yesterday uh, an incredible presentation by Arion uh, Vogley and how he's uh, approaching the Albanian translation. And then today you heard from Ch Ch uh, Palir Chibwana, uh, and he is a key man in a key place at a key time. Uh, doing a mighty work, and you've already been introduced to him. You've already, many of you, let me just show a hands. How many of you worked on the Chichewa New Testaments? I'm just kind of curious. 
I would say, man, uh, probably 80% of you, maybe 75% of us have actually already been part of that project. And that is a translation project. I just want to, before I have uh, Tony come up, I want to just kind of remind you of what's led us here in regard to this particular, um, you know, discussion of, of translation in the, in the video you saw. Pastor Randy, because it was on his heart, he obviously has a heart for Africa, even though he's still here in the States. Uh, and he's obviously got his eye on the ball. He's looking at what's going on around the world. And uh, TBS put out a little pamphlet, and, and Randy noticed that the Chichewa was being translated. And he knew uh, that Chichewa was the language that was spoken in Malawi. He's a missionary there. And also that uh, a miss our missionary, Dan Jalawick, was also dealing with Chichewa-speaking people. So, so, you know, he's just inquired. And, and at, when's it going to be ready? Uh, maybe we could do that as one of our projects. You know, he knows, we know Brian Kioma, we know, we know uh, Dan Jalowick, we know Palira Chibwana. So we know several men on the ground, key men that can not only uh, read the word, but they can preach the word, they can teach the word, and they need to get the word in the hands of the people in which they're ministering to. And so that was part one, of course, and you all uh, know Mark Trotter or knew Mark Trotter. We still know him. He'll, we'll see him again soon. Uh, and Mark Trotter, uh, you know, was a key man here, right, to connect all of that and bring that for some reason in God's providence through Pastor Randy, through uh, Pastor Mark, through all those other pieces. God in his providence has said, hey, we want you guys, and I say you guys, meaning all of our churches that are represented here, the living faith churches, the non-living faith churches, everybody that's here that's engaged in all this. He wanted all of our churches involved in getting that, that Bible to those peoples. And Jeremy said it, he, God has a passion for people, uh, and he has a passion for people that are poor, and those are some poor people. And some are poor in spirit, some are poor uh, in physical things, and so, of course, Laodiceans don't always have good discernment on what rich and poor is. Uh, but I can tell you some of the richest investments that are going on are in Zambia and in Malawi and in Africa, right? And so, so there's a reason God's wanting to put his seed there, because he's knows he's, he's going to get an ROI, he's going to get a return on his investment. And, uh, and, and I don't mean physically, spiritually. He's going to get what he wants. So phase two of this, um, uh, I don't think Randy's told the story, so I'm going to tell your story for us. And so, so Randy's, you know, being Randy, he's just rolling through life, doing what he does in ministry. And um, one day he gets a call from the Trinitarian Bible Society. And they're like, uh, can we, can we, can you help us? We lost our translator and we're trying to finish up this Chichewa Old Testament do you know anybody that could help us? So for some reason, no offense to Randy, but I mean, Randy's the key guy. I mean, the, when you got the people calling here in the middle of nowhere in a cow field, calling up Pastor Randy, say, hey, Randy, can you help us? Uh, Randy's like, yeah, I can. And so, uh, so we were able to get, you know, we, uh, first of all, we, we asked, you know, we spoke with Palira and uh, you know, got his mind on it, and he was minded to want to help with that project. He was exactly what they they needed someone that was skilled in English, skilled in Chichewa, and that could you know could work on the the final uh, draft of this Old Testament. And so, uh, Pastor Palera, who you just saw, was put in contact um, through the relationship that Randy had with the Trinitarians. All because, just get this, guys, it's it's the little things. It's because one day he was looking through a pamphlet and said, hmm. Those people need the word, and here they're they're trans. I didn't know that. Let me talk to somebody and see what could happen next. Maybe we could get in on it, and and so we're in on it, and we're in on it all the way. So I'm looking forward to the day when we're doing the whole Bible, the whole Chichewa Bible at one of these conferences, and all the churches are involved, and we're having that Philadelphian partnership. Why? Because starting back on Sunday morning, right? We had a heart to get the word of God into the souls of men, right? We understand this history. We're 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 just entering into the story of how God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He left us his written word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his church. We're building on what God is doing till he catches us away. And then, of course, we talked about how that develops the Philadelphian partnerships. And man, oh, man, did we get a message last night about, uh, you know, who could get in way of this mission is us, right? So we got to get ourselves out of the way so that God can do what he needs to do to get his Bibles, get his word uh, where it needs to go. And that inevitably will involve projects just like you have been seeing, whether it's the, the Tonga, the Albanian, the Chichewa, and the ones that we don't even know about yet, right? Maybe there's going to be a time uh, where we're going to be involved in the Vietnamese project or something like that. Who knows? 
but God will have other projects because his heart is to get the word of God, a reliable word in their hands, a preserved word. We're so fortunate, as Jeremy said, to have it. And so I'm excited tonight uh, to have a dear brother in Christ, a friend of mine, a friend of our churches, Iola Harvest Baptist, has been so faithful over the years uh, to come. Uh, rather, Tony speaking, not speaking, they are consistently here. You know why? Because they love God's word. They're about putting the, getting the word where it needs to go on time as a church. I know Pastor Tony as a pastor is like that. He and his wife, Kara, are tremendous saints, and uh, we love them. We love to partner with Harvest Baptist in whatever way we can, and we're so thankful, Tony, to you and your church. And just being up here Sunday, it was precious, man. And those, those kids that you brought, and I mean, he's intentional. He's already been in touch with Arion. He's educating his church. He's an example of the believers in word and deed. You don't have to be pastor in a mega church of a million people or a thousand people, hundred people. Uh, I mean, whatever. I mean, he's getting it done in every way, and God's really blessing the work at Harvest Baptist in Iola. And I'm so excited tonight to have Tony come up and really challenge us on this particular subject of translation. And as he comes, I, I pray that, that some of you would be praying about your part in that. You know, maybe some is calling, maybe God's calling some of you to even participate in being a translator someday. So with that, give Tony some love as he comes up and preaches to us here at HBF tonight. What's up, everybody? We all good? All right, hey, do me a favor if you would. Be making your way to 2 Kings 18. Brian, I love you, man. Man, I love you. I love this church. Man, I just walk in and I bring people with me because I want them to know you and I want them to meet you, right? And uh, I think we had a team on Sunday of just shy of 30 come up and make the trip and just come and put their hands to the work and they can't stay for the service because they got school the next day, you know, what have you. But man, it was just, just sweet just to be able to do that and give tours and what have you and I get stuck in the middle of tours because I'm finding people I love <laughs> and I'm hugging on them and they're just like I don't know this person why are we why they're not the main person no this is about Bible. you're right and so we get back to the tour and whatever but man our, our church does love it and um, man I just I'm thankful to be um, join hands with with another church that understands that God preserves that which is important to him he preserves his people, and he preserves his word. And I love it when God's people get a hold of that and understand it and truly, truly grasp it. So, you ever said that? You ever said those words? Because I have. In fact, I said them not long ago to my son. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, then repeat them back to me, please. Because if you can repeat them back to me, then I'll know whether you understood them or not. And he'll give me a paraphrase. I'm like, no, that's not what I said. I don't need a paraphrase. I need you to understand what I said. No, the son's a good kid. He's, he's pretty excellent at a lot of things that he does. But sometimes you just need some direction. But I just need to know that as I speak into you, you know, that you're understanding the words that come out of my mouth. And, you know, I think my mom said that about a thousand times to me. And uh, no one ever said it better, in my opinion, than Chris Tucker in the movie Rush Hour. You understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Yeah, man, man, come on. <laughs> great theologian right there. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for Chris Tucker. All right, so I just want, I, I think sometimes we, we, we try to share the gospel, we try to preach, we try to do things, and we don't necessarily speak in a way that we expect them to fully understand what are coming, what's coming out of our mouth. All right, so that's the message title. But there's a couple questions I want you to consider and just be having percolating in your mind, right? As we, as we get, it's going to take us a minute to get to 2 Kings 18. We're like on ramping here, right? Now, the first question I want you to consider is this question. Do we understand the need for translating the king's message into the languages of the people? Do we understand that? That's the first question I really want you to consider, is do we understand the need for translating the king's message into the languages of the people? And I say languages, plural. 
Uh, and understand, it's the king's message, not his paraphrase, not the message, right? It's the king's message. The king has something to say. Now, that's going to come in handy in just a little bit. You'll understand why. And, and man, Jeremy, I, I appreciate this because here's where I think a lot of us get as Americans is we have access to the Word of God in our language, on our devices, in our Bibles, in our small little Bibles, in our New Testament. I mean, we got it everywhere. My, I have audio Bibles that I prefer, right? Like Bible.is is like the thing, man. I love it, right? Because I have access to the Word of God. And here's the problem. I take it for granted. I take it for granted the amount of people that had to lay down their lives to give me my copy of the Word of God. I'm thankful for that. Listen, here's something else I think, here's the reason why I think we take it for granted as well, is that we have a language, English, that the world is speaking. Truth? I mean, go to Malawi, Africa, In I've been there. I've been to Malawi. I've been five hours in a field, no road. I mean, I've been there. And there's somebody speaking English when we get there. Right? So, and I, I, I get, I'm like, what is going on here? The English is everywhere. And the world is learning it and the world is speaking it, no doubt about it. I think there's a reason for that. And while we may not say it, I think we often just assume that people are just going to figure it out one day. They'll just get it. They'll figure it out. That, that's, not, that's not right. That's not right. So that's the first question I want you to consider. The second question is a little bit longer. Do we understand what the world system understands? See, that's the key. Because the world system understands translation. Do we understand what the world system understands about the need for translating the king's message into the languages of the people? Because the world's really good at translation. The world system, and I would even venture to say the Antichrist system, is very good and very talented and very skilled and very intentional in language, in translation of languages. All right, so let me give you an example of this. In the book of Esther, you have Ahasuerus and, and Vashti, and remember Vashti kind of, you know, the whole, the whole little thing. Hey, he wants to show her off, and she's like, uh, no, not too interested in being shown off, and so... Um, he kind of shoves her out the door and all the wise men said, yeah, but if, if, the, if the king's wife can rebel, then my wife can rebel and that's not a good thing. So they pass this law and they so send it out to all the provinces. Check this out. Esther chapter 1 verse 22. Esther chapter 1 verse 22 says, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, check this out, according to the writing thereof. In other words, every province had a different way of writing. Right? Chinese, right? Up to down, right? Uh, Arabic, right to left. Uh, Western mindset, left to right. Uh, it's usually centered on Jerusalem. Wherever Jerusalem is, that's the direction people write. I think that's pretty interesting. All right, hey, we're, did we lose that verse? We have it up there? Esther, uh, Esther 122, according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. And so here's a government that is over numerous provinces that speak different languages and they're writing according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. Why? That every man, the goal is to get to every person, that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Not enough just the, the king's message needs to go forth to every man in their language, in the way that they write. That's the world system. The world gets it. Now, I'm a movie, movie buff. You hang out with me a little bit, you'll find out that I like to watch movies. But I'm a weird dude. Because when I watch movies, I kind of figure the movie out in about three or four minutes. I know how it's pretty much, except for that Sixth Sense movie. That one had me messed up. <laughs> I'll be honest. That one had me messed up. But there's a movie out. It's come out like you know, four or five years ago. It's called The Movie Arrival. You guys ever seen that movie, The Arrival? I'm the only wicked person that watches movies. Is that the, okay, thank you. Thank you for being honest. All right, so it's an it's a Amy Adams movie or whatever. It's a weird movie. And the whole premise, I'm going to ruin it for you. So just know I'm going to ruin the movie for you. The whole, the whole premise is aliens show up, UFO comes and lands, it's in the shape of a teardrop looking thing, kind of weird, it reminds me a little bit of Zechariah, and so it shows up, 
and they're trying to figure the whole thing out, and they begin to figure, why are these guys here? They're here to destroy us, and the idea is, no, the aliens came to bring the, United, to bring the world a gift, and what was the gift? You guys are divided. You're fighting all the time. You know what would really unite everybody? If everybody spoke the same language. If everybody would just speak the same language, everything would be okay. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound a little, little, little bit like, the, like Babylon, Genesis chapter 11? I mean, that's kind of messed up. Oh, by the way, what's the new movie coming out in January? Brought to you by Brad Pitt. Babylon. That's the name of the movie. Uh, what's it about? It's about Hollywood becoming Hollywood. And the message behind it. It's Babylon. So when I watch movies, I pay attention because here's what I've learned according to Titus chapter 1. If you study society's art, you will find out what has its art. And so I watch movies and I'm paying attention. What, does, what are they saying? What are they doing? They're speaking people's languages. And they do it through film, and they do it through music, and they do it through all those things. And I'm happy to let them tell me what they're saying. And so, man, I'm, hang out with me. I'm a conspiracy theorist kind of dude. Just, this is what it is. But here's what I do know. They got it figured out. You can't go anywhere on the planet and not find Coca-Cola. Everybody speaks Coca-Cola, right? You can't go anywhere on the planet, and everybody knows about covid Right? That message got around the world quick. Right? They're really good at getting information out, which also tells me that they're really good at keeping information out. All right, so what does that tell me? That tells me that the world system takes translation very seriously. They take it seriously. Do we? Now, here's another principle I want to share with you, is that if the world places value on something then I think we should probably put value on it too. Now, there's a verse that haunts me. It's in Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. Genesis chapter 14, verse 21 says, And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Now, this is after Lot's been taken captive by the five kings, and Abram goes and goes and rescues them from the five kings, and the king of Sodom's like, Hey, um, you can have all the money, baby. Just give me the persons. What does that tell me? tells me the world system isn't interested in money. It's not interested in riches. It's interested in souls. And if the world values souls, then so should I. Y'all with me? So if the world values translation, then therefore I better be valuing tra translation. And so the world is willing and able to speak. They are. They are willing and able to speak in whatever language is necessary to instill a message of fear and confusion. Not a message of hope. It's a message of fear and confusion. And where do they plant that seed? Into the hearts of people. Y'all with me? That is the king's message. And the world system knows the best way to reach someone's heart is through the language of their heart. All right. So we're going to get to 2 Kings to the base text here in just a second. So we've got to get a run and start. So let's, let's set the stage here because when Brian asked me to consider coming and preaching and on the topic of translation, you remember this conversation? I was sitting in the coffee shop. I don't know if I told you that. It was really good. So I was sitting in the coffee shop and he, he called me or texted me or something and I had just been reading over this passage in the topic of translation, going, man, this is really important. i got to get some stuff down. He says, hey, I want you to come and preach a message on translation. All right. <laughs> I think we'll do that. So I was cross-referencing, because this passage in 2 Kings 18 is also mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36. Right? And so you can get some parallel passages there. So we're going to get to the main text, which is over way over in verse 25, 26 and there. But we've got to go to verse 9 just for a moment. And don't panic. We're not reading all those verses. We're not. But let me just set the stage just for a moment. Because in verses 9 to 12, you have the king of Assyria, 
which represents the world system, the Antichrist system, the world system. The king of Assyria carries Israel, the nation of Israel, those ten tribes on the northern side, comes to take Israel out of the land and disperses them across the world. In other words, they're God's people who have access to, to the king's message. They got access to the word of God. And you'll find in verse 12 that they disobeyed the word of God. They wouldn't keep the word of God, and therefore they were removed. Right? Right? So you see that in verses 9 to 12. Now check this out in verse 11. So it comes and besieges it. It takes them three years to, to conquer all these guys and, and take them out. But he says this in verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel, check this out, unto Assyria and put them in Halah and in Habor by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Why? Why would they do that? Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. So what they do? They bounced on the word of God and they went the way of the world. And guess what Hezekiah has? Hezekiah is just to the south. He's the king of Judah. He's just to the south and he has a front row seat to watch people he knows, people of, of his ilk, another group of believers bounce on the word of God. Have we seen that happen today? People that we love, people who are just over there bouncing and walking and turning their back on the Lord and through his word. Oh, man, it breaks my heart. And Hezekiah is sitting there watching this, watching this happen. Now, can I just give you a little side note? I thought this was just interesting. I think this is cool. Um, in verse 11, it takes them from the land of Canaan, the promised land, and takes them north into Halah and Haber and Gozan and, and that whole area. Okay, that's the land of Haran, right? Genesis chapter 11, um, where Abram came out of Ur, the Chaldees, Babylon, made his way up to Haran. And then God said, okay, it's time, Genesis chapter 12, come down to the land of Canaan. And what's interesting is when God removes his people out of the land, it goes the same pattern, back to the north, and then Babylon comes in and takes them back to Babylon. I think that's very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. All right, so then you get to verses 13 to 16. Because here in verses 13 to 16, uh, the northern tribes are gone, though, right? It's been eight years now. Eight years later, Hezekiah is now being besieged by the Assyrians, and so Hezekiah and Judah are next. And you know what he does? He throws money at the problem. That's what he does. He throws money at the problem. And what do churches do when things are going bad and there's a difficult time? Instead of running the word, they run to their pockets. And, the, and the, sure enough, that's what happens here. So he says, hey, I've offended you, verse 14. And it says this in verse 15. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. Okay. Was he given? He's giving silver that's in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. In verse 16. And at that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. So what's he do? It's hard time. Here comes the world system after after now uh, Judah and, and Hezekiah. And what does he do? He throws money at it and he causes the house, the Lord's house to go broke. And here's what I mean by broke. There's no more gold and there's no more silver. And what are we supposed to be building our house of the Lord with? Gold, silver, and precious stones. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age where God's people that once would stay firm and hold a true a standard on the word of God, when difficult times come, they sacrifice the reward. And they gave up what was in the treasures. In other words, no longer have a full reward. And it's gone. And so there's no more gold or silver to speak of in the temple or on the temple. Oh, can we get that message? How you treat the word of God, how, you, how we interact with this world system, how we deal with this issue of preservation has everything to do with the gold and silver in the temple. We, by the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are the temple of God, right? 
We are the temples of God. But then you get a little bit further. Because it's, the world system is not interested in your money. What's the world system interested in? What's you? They want souls. Hey, can I buy them off? Nope. Nope. That's, they, all they want is my taxes. All they want, no, they don't care about your taxes. They care about you. You are the merchandise, according to Peter. Peter says, you are the merchandise. I am the merchandise. So, verse 17, And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshekah from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. Now, check this out. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. So you have a new king of Assyria. His name is Sennacherib, Sennacherib. We had a little chat about this. I don't even know how to say his name, so I call him the Sincherib or the Snatcherib. <laughs> so he's either Sincherib or Snatcherib. You can figure it out. So that dude, you read about him over here in, in verse 13, first time you ever find his name in the Bible, by the way. So he sends three dudes. He sends... Tartan, Rapsaurus, and this Rabshekah dude. But not just three guys. He sends three guys with a large army, with a, with a great host, and then they come and they stand by where the water flows. What does Ephesians chapter 5 tell us about the Word of God? That is like waters. What does Psalm 1 say? It's like waters. What does Jeremiah chapter 17 say? It's like waters. And so it comes and they, and they stand by where the water flows. In other words... We're going to cut your water off, yo. We're going to do it. We're going to cut the water off. And so they're standing there, and then they come to the place where the people on the wall could hear. So they get just close enough. So they're out of firing distance a little bit. They're just a ways, and they show up, and the, there's, the people are on the wall seeing them come up, shaking in their boots. And then what does Hezekiah do? He sends out three dudes. He sends out three guys, and you see that. Um, here in, uh, I had that verse highlighted here. All right, so verse 18. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And so three messengers from one king are face to face with three messengers from from the other king, right? And they're now having a dialogue. Then Rabshakeh pops up and Rabsheki or how. Rap dude, right? So he starts, he starts talking. He starts giving, giving them the business. Here's what the king has to say. Don't trust in the Lord. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in Egypt. And they're just talking a whole lot of smack. Y'all got the set? You got the, you got the land? You got it set up? All right, the stage has been set. Now let's get to the message. Because here's the thing we have to do. We have to learn the importance of translation from the world system. We can learn from the world system the importance of translation because you got to see this. He says, um, verse 26, skip over to verse 26. Then said Eliakim, so Rabshik has just get, gone on this long monologue. And then, then says Eliakim, verse 26, the son of Hilkiah, the Shebna, and Shebna the Joah unto Rabshik, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language. For we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. In other words, when they show up and they start talking smack, they're not talking in their heart language. They're talking in the language of the, in the heart language of the people they're trying to conquer. And the whole time he's talking, all Eliakim can think of, I wish he would just shut up and speak in a different language. Would he just stop talking? They can hear you. Do you not know that they can hear you? Would you would, you're, you're in the ears of the people on the wall. They can hear you. Would you just talk to us in Syrian? And then check out the response. Check out the response. Verse 27. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak thee words? Uh-uh. Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall? Ooh. Okay. We're going to come to that here in just a few moments. 
But here's the first thing I want you to get here. Here's what we can learn. The first thing we can learn is that the world speaks the people's heart language. The world speaks the people's heart language. I think it was a few years ago I had the opportunity to preach. Used the book of Romans. Man, that was fun. Had a blast. And I think I mentioned in there that I would like to learn another language. But I'm four years, years old now. And language learning is a little bit difficult for me. Right? I would love to learn Espanol. It doesn't flow off the lips. It just doesn't. I practice and I'm, all right, so we have 15 Mexican restaurants in Iola. Hyperbole, but not really. And there's a lady there who just, man, I built a little, um, rep. that's the word. You understand the words coming out of my mouth? Right, that word. Right, so sometimes she'll say, no, order that in Spanish. I'm like, eh, el numero, <laughs> this, you know, whatever. And she'll say, she goes, you're not listening to what I'm saying. Like, she'll say it, I repeat it, and just, she just gives up. She goes, you want the usual? Yeah, that one. I'll, I'll have that. Okay. Well, listen, the world speaks the people's heart language. They know it. They know how to speak it. They're always asking what does the heart want? What does their heart want? And then they sow their message into hearts and not heads. That's what they're doing. And so when they show up and they got the huge host and they're all there and they just begin to speak in Hebrew, immediately they have everybody on the wall's attention. And they're hearing everything that's being said. Now, check this verse out. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Here's how they do it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. He says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity. That's what they do. That's what the enemy does. It's words of vanity. In other words, they're empty. What do they do? Well, they are lure through the lust of the flesh. They find out what you want. And then they speak to whatever your itch is. And they're willing to scratch it, baby. So they will, they will lure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. All right, so we're going to come back to that verse here a little bit later. But remember what Rapshika's response was in verse 27 and 28? He says, listen, did my master come to talk to, the mess to you or to them? He understood who the audience was. It wasn't these, these Yehus. It was the guys on the wall. That's who he wanted to speak to. And then he says this in verse 28. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, he just goes, hey, you up there. I'm done talking to them. I'm talking to you. I got something to say to you. All right, so here's the next thing we got to get. The world speaks the pe people's heart language in a way that they can hear. And sometimes we say we're passionate about translation. We say we're, we say we're passionate about reaching people all over the world. And it's just not true. Because we're not putting people in a position to speak to somebody else, not just in their heart language, but in a way that they can hear it. Just like Ahasuerus did in Esther. I'm going to do it according to the writing thereof. And in the spoken language thereof. In other words, I, I don't want them to just hear it. I want them to have access to it. I want the written word to them. All right, so we, we can learn from that. But here's something we need to understand. Sin cherub, right? Snatch a rib. You know what he did? He sent qualified, dedicated messengers. That's what he did. He had a message and he wanted to not just talk to Hezekiah, he wanted to talk to everybody on that wall. So who's he send? Qualified, dedicated people who understood the message, understood that the king had no interest in them having anything to say but what he had to say. And listen, we, we're really good at sending people all over the world. We, we can sit, we, listen, we're, we're rich, we can throw money at the problem. And we can, we can put people on planes and get them anywhere quickly. But are they, are they qualified? 
And are they dedicated to the king's message? And are they able to speak in their heart language? And not just that, are they able to speak in their heart language in a way that they can hear? And then a step further on this is that they, they don't talk to the educated elites. They talk to the common man. Mark chapter 12, verse 37, part B. And the common people heard him gladly. Speaks to the common man. So in essence, what he's saying here in verse 28, Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. You know what he's saying? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? That's what he's saying. In the Jews' language, that's what he's saying. And everybody on the wall gets it. All right, we've got to go a step further, though, because check this out in verse 29. Here's what Rabshakeh, he's not done talking. He says, thus saith the king. Oh, don't miss that. Thus saith the king. Here's the next point I want you to get. The world speaks the people's heart language in a way that they can hear the king's words. They don't just speak the heart language. And they don't just speak in a way that they can hear. They speak in a way that they can hear the king's words. That's the reality. I think, man, I've had the opportunity to go to Albania. I've had the opportunity to go to Belarus and to, and to Malawi. I've had opportunities to go to different places that I don't speak their language. I'm always grateful that there's somebody there who does. Right? Right? And here's what's amazing, is they always speak my language, but I don't speak theirs, right? And I've had the pleasure of being connected with translators that understood the king's words, right? I've heard horror stories of people have gone and they've just hired Joe Blow off the street, and they might be able to speak a language, but this doesn't mean they understand the king's words, I've had the opportunity to preach with Palira as my translator. That is like a surreal moment, right? Homeboy understands English. He gets Chichewa, but he understands the king's words. But I want you to pay attention to what comes out of Rabshakeh's mouth and what the king's words are. Verse 29, thus said the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria now understand you need to understand something the Assyrians had a different view of the Lord and they had a different view of a king's authority and the key in the 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 Assyrians he's like hey I'm ruling the world here. It's the Antichrist system, right? It's the world system. Hezekiah is just a dude who just lost 10 of his other tribes, gone to oblivion. And you need to understand that they don't respect the Lord Most High. They don't respect God. And so here's the message of the world system. You can't trust men to save you from coming judgment. Don't trust in Hezekiah. You can't trust man to save you in coming judgment. Sounds a lot like the message we preach, isn't it? We, man can't save. Only God can. And you know what the next thing he says? You can't trust the Lord either. In other words, in their mind, this is what he's saying, is you can't trust in religion to save you from coming judgment either. Sounds a lot like our message, doesn't it? It's a counterfeit message. You can't trust in man, and you can't trust in religion from coming judgment of the world system. By the way, that's kind of true. Because that's what this world's going to find. Ain't no man and ain't no religion going to protect this world from the world system ruling and reigning. Y'all with me? All right. 
So let's go a little bit, let's go a little bit deeper then. So check this out of verse 31. Verse 31. He says, hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria. What's he do? He puts him to two different authorities, doesn't he? Two different authorities. You have the, the, your king or this king. Either way, what they're saying is this is going to be your king one day. And I want you to hear what he has to say. For thus saith the king of Assyria. And then he says this, make an agreement with me by a present. Okay. So here's the next point I want you to get. The world speaks the people's heart language in a way that they can hear the king's words and submit to his authority. So yes, they speak the heart language, but they speak the heart language in a way that they can hear, but in a way that they can hear the king's message and in a way that they can hear the king's message and submit to that king. That's what we do every day, peeps. Amen? We do that. That's what God has put us on this planet to do, is to do that right there. Speak their heart language. Speak it in a way that they can hear it. Speak it in a way they can hear it and hear the king's message. This one. Hear the king's message. Why would we do that? So that I can submit to that king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The world gets it. I think so often we don't. Now, I don't know what, listen, if I were in your pants in those seats, this is what I would be thinking. I'm never going to translate anything. I'm not learning another language. I'm not doing that, right? Like, where are you going with this? I'm, yeah, amen, but what does it have to do with me? And I love how Jeff Bartell puts it. The opposite the opposite of you going is not you staying. It's you sending. That's it. That should be the heart behind this. Listen, I know we're tired. I know we're burnt out. I know this is pretty much the same every single year. I get it. The rolling's always there. The checking's always there. The binder's always there. And the cutter's always broken. <laughs> right? I get it. Fully understand it. But this is a new Bible for a new person. That's why we do what we do. I want them to hear it in a way that they can hear the king's message according to their writing, according to their language, so that they will submit to the king. And you know what we want them to believe? That they can't trust in man to save them from coming judgment. And they can't trust in religion to save them from coming judgment. But he's still not done talking. Homeboy won't shut up. Check this out. He says, I want you to make an agreement with me, verse 31. Make an agreement with me by a present. Isn't that interesting? What does God offer us? Salvation through a gift, isn't it? And he's saying, yeah, there's salvation through a gift instead of God giving you the gift that I want you to give me the gift. So that's what's, that's what's going to save you. Instead of me giving you a gift, you're going to give me a gift. Oh, is, is that how it works? Well, that, that's, that's how this is supposed to be done. You submit to me by offering me a present. And then it says, and come out to me, come out from among them and be ye separate. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And then ye eat and ye every man of his own vine uh, and every one of his, of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his sister. Now doctrinally, he's referring to the millennial reign of Christ where every Jew in his, is going to have his own land, his own fig tree, his own everything. That's doctrinally what he's referring to. And yet for us, inspirationally, here's what we can apply that to. He's promising them sustaining and sure food and water to every individual. Sounds a lot like the word of God to me. But then he's not done. Verse 32, until I come and take you away into a land like unto your own land. In other words, um, you're going to enter an agreement with me through a gift. You're going to be given a sure food and water. You're going to be given that for a temporary time, and then I'm coming to get you. Does this sound familiar to anybody else? Then I'm coming to get you. I'm going to take you out of this land into a new land. Sounds a lot like heaven to me, man. 
Sounds a lot like heaven to me. Oh, but he's still not done. He says it's a, it's a land of oil and, and olives and, and honey. He says, look at this, middle of verse 32, that ye may live and not die. Sounds a lot like eternal life to me. Now check this out. I told you we're going to go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. We've got to read the next verse too. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. He says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lust of the flesh. In other words, empty lies. Snatch rib, snatch a rib, right? Empty lies, that's what's happening here. That allures through the lust of the flesh. What's the itch of your heart? I'm willing to scratch it. Through much wantonness, those that are escaped from them who live in error. Look at this. While they promise them liberty, freedom. Man, if you didn't have all of this problem, the government would supply you all of this. Ooh, sounds pretty familiar. Did you notice it didn't mention a steak and it didn't mention any meat whatsoever? It was a vegetarian <laughs> society. Sounds almost like the impossible meat. The end times talks about that right there, according to 2 Peter. It says, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. All the goal is, is not to provide you freedom, but to corrupt you. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as you brought in bondage. All right, so crazy whack story. I get it. And yet, if we truly step back and look at this thing doctrinally and understand the world system understands the Lord system. And the world system imitates the Lord system. And they're really good at it. And we have something we can learn from them. You see, our first two questions, the first one was this. Do we understand the need for translating the king's message into the language of, languages of the people? That's the first one I asked you to consider. But the second question was, do we understand what the world system understands about the need for translating. In other words, they understand some things. Do we understand what they understand? Because we can learn a lot from the world. Now let me land the plane with a couple practical applications. The first one is this. Verse, verse 36. Verse 36, check this out. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. All the king said to all the people who were on the wall was, Whatever he says, keep your mouth shut, answer him not. And so Rabshiki does all his, uh, he's speaking all his stuff, and every person on the wall heard him speak in, in their heart language, in a way that it was able to be heard, and the message was, submit to this king, and they answered him not. And the first application I want you to get is submit to the authority of the king's version of truth. Think about that hard enough, you'll, you'll figure out what I'm saying. The, the king's version. Submit to that. Submit to the authority of the king's version because the world has got a lot of things to say and those words are empty and they don't lead to liberty. They lead to corruption. That's the first application I want you to get. This one isn't on there. So hold on a second. If you would, go back with me. Over here to 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 11 and 12. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Halah and in Haber by the river Gozen and the cities of the Medes because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God but transgressed his covenant. Listen. We need to understand this as well. It's not on the screen. I just need you to pick up what I'm putting down. There is judgment for those. Well, let me put it this way. There's judgment for this dispensation who chooses not to be obedient to the word of God. I'm telling you, we are in the last days of the last days of the Laodicean church age. And the rapture of the church is not a celebration moment to be looking forward to. 
The rapture of the church is judgment. God removes every steward in every dispensation. The rapture of the church is the removal of the steward. And we are the steward of this. Amen. We are the steward of this. And if we don't handle it right, and we don't treat it right, day is coming where God says, that's it. I'm done. You don't have an option anymore. But what's interesting is seven or eight years later that God has to deal with the Jews. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Last one, we find this in verse 17. Go back to verse 17. And this is it. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rapsiris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to the king of Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is the highway of the fuller's field. Last point. Enlist a great host to support the king's messengers who are sent with the king's message to speak to the people in their heart language. That is our mess. That's our mission. That's how we practically ap apply this. Enlist a great host. Hello, church. Hello, churches who have gathered here. How many of you are from HBF here? Raise your hand. A lot. How many of you are from a different church other than HBF? Right? You know what that is? It's a great host. It's a great host. How many other churches have been represented here throughout this week? A lot. Our job is to be the host, to support the king's messengers. That's the missionaries. That's the pastors. That's Palira, right? To support the king's messengers who are sent with the king's message. That's the written word. To speak to the people in their heart language. That's the Bible in their native tongue. That's our job. May we be busy about that. I want to close with one little story. I talked to Pastor Mike Renault the other day. He's church plant in Boston. Some of us are getting ready to go up there and see him next week. And I'm like, dude, I need to get a lay of the land. I need to just tell me what to do. And anyways, we went through all that, but he told me a quick little story. I don't know if you heard this or not. But uh, last trip, the group that was there last month, that Sunday, a Chinese student from one of the local universities showed up to church. Wasn't invited by any of the crew, just showed up. Said, man, I just wanted to find an American church and just figure it out and found you guys and showed up. Well, he speaks Chinese of whether it's Mandarin or Cantonese, I don't know. He speaks Chinese. Well, there's a group there from Midtown I think it's Midtown. I think it's Midtown. And one of them is a Chinese-speaking individual. And so Mike says, well, I'd like to introduce you to whoever this is. And this person got to go in the heart language and lead that guy to Christ. He got saved. Now, it was of the Lord that he was there. Praise the Lord. But how awesome was it that when he walked in, there was somebody that spoke his heart language. And somebody that was able to speak it in a way that he could hear in a way that he could hear the king's message so that he would submit. And how do we know he submitted? Because the very next day he was out preaching Jesus with the team. That's why we do what we do. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Well, I appreciate that, Tony. Good, good word. Let's, uh, you know, consider what we've heard and consider